Jack of the Lantern by Moxie Labouche. Not a soul like Jack. There's one in every village, a man no one likes, and with good reason. Jack did not have one friend in the houses or surrounding farms. He probably didn't have a friend in the whole of the county. He came by their negative esteem, honestly. Jack liked a pint. He was a devil for the drink. Erstwhile a decent farrier and smith, Jack was now an exceptional drunk. Replete though he was, he never had a cent to give anyone, except the publican and only if his beer had no foam. Those cents had known no honest path to his pocket. Half the day steaming drunk, Jack was still a crafty bastard. He could talk a nun out of her wimple in the middle of the square. On a good day, he could get her habit, too. Items and animals that went missing from porch or pen weren't said to have gone missing, but rather, they've gone to Jack. This clear prince among men found his name on the sneer of everyone in the village. His legend needed no help, but even still, the tales of his travesties began to slide that way. A traveler sitting alone to the side of the pub listened intently. This sounds like quite the fellow, the traveler said, only to himself. His is an acquaintance I shall have to make. Three men at the nearest table were happy to tell the traveler where to find Jack. The traveler was physically sound, but with none of the roughness of life made in the field or on the sea. He carried himself with a certain bearing, and his clothes were nicer than anything that could be purchased for many miles. The village men hoped he was a tax collector or a solicitor with bad news. Jack sat at a table at the back of the pub. It was not especially his table, but no one else would sit with him for fear of being the latest victim of his brazen greed. The traveler approached, and after waiting in vain for an invitation, or even acknowledgement, sat down across from Jack. Are you the man about whom I've heard such entertaining stories? Jack appraised the traveler, not even trying to be subtle about it. A fancy man in a simple village was about the easiest mark there was. Aye, but they tell them wrong over there. See us to a little more lubrication and I'll tell you me tales the likes of which you've never heard before nor since. A landlord, the traveler said, raising an elegant hand. Two bitters. Four. Jack shot in. I don't plan to drink two. I don't plan for you to eat her. <laughs> the traveler chuffed. Four bitters. The traveler settled back down into his seat. Your reputation was scarcely hard fought, was it? Jack shrugged one shoulder. Men say what they will. The publican brought four pints of dark amber beer and abandoned them on the table, tray and all, retreating from his least favorite customer and this peculiar stranger. Jack drank the first pint as if it might otherwise escape from him. The traveler sipped his beer and waited. Jack was halfway through the next pint before he announced, Your old Nick, the devil himself. How did you reason it so quickly? Only the devil would willingly pay for my drinks. On that score, you'd better pay the landlord. Excuse me? You ordered the drinks. You should be the one to pay. I am the star of the morning and the father of lies. What makes you think I wouldn't walk out on a bar tab? Jack waved his objection away. That's beneath you. It's not evil. It's barely even naughty. What are you, a leprechaun? Did you go around tricking one man at a time? Nah, Robbing a landlord of four pints of bitter isn't the devil's work. The devil was silent for a moment as he sipped his beer. I don't carry cash, he said quietly. Jack rolled his eyes. All the powers of evil in creation and you can't work your way around this? The devil narrowed his eyes at Jack. Look, you can change shape, can't you? So turn yourself into a coin. I'll hand you to the landlord and then you change back. The bitter is paid for, and we get a bit of crack when you scare half the life out of them. The devil considered this a moment, annoyed by the soundness of the plan and the fact that a mortal man could even put ideas in his head. Nevertheless, he agreed with a nod. Right! Jack barked and tossed down the last of his beer. 
He held out a flat hand and waited. The devil, still unsure why he was going along at all, disappeared in the span of a blink, and just as quickly, a coin was on Jack's palm. He gave it a bounce and enjoyed the heavy feel. Jack stood up, poured most of the third beer down his throat, and dropped the coin in his pocket. The landlord behind the bar only shook his head in irritation as Jack walked out without paying again. As his feet hit the dirt outside, Jack patted his pocket. The large coin smacked against a silver crucifix and chain, and Jack smiled. Even without the tiny sacred figure of Jesus, silver was the enemy of all things mythical or evil, including, as he'd hoped, the very devil. As long as that cross lay against the coin, the devil was trapped. You'll not be taking my soul today. Fully pleased with himself, Jack sauntered staggeringly home, the coin buzzing like a hornet the entire way. Once home, Jack took the large ornate crucifix from above his hearth and went out to the stable for a hammer and a handful of nails. He trekked a bit into the woods behind the barn and found the largest oak tree there was to be found. With nails clamped between his teeth, Jack nailed the crucifix to the trunk of the tree. All this walking and doing, he could do with another pint. After satisfying himself that no amount of pulling would free the cross, Jack dropped his hammer and pulled the coin and cross from his pocket. Leaning back, he threw them both as hard as he could into the tall branches of the tree. The cross knocked from branch to branch before falling to the earth. The coin, on the other hand, turned into a very angry man who grabbed tightly to the branches. The devil had abandoned the dapper guise he'd worn at the start of the night and stared with rage in his red, scaly glory. That was more clever than it was smart. The devil snarled and made to climb down. As his feet neared the lowest branches, the crucifix of silver drove him back as if with a physical shove. Let me down, the devil roared. Swear you won't take my soul. I would drown you in a lake of fire with my own hand. And enjoy your day out in the open air. The devil stopped shaking the branches. It's a fine sunny time of year. You could do it a bit of sunshine, I'd wager. There was a reason the devil was not known to do his work in the clean, pure light of day. Say you won't take my soul. Agreed. Do I have your sworn word? The devil bared his pointed teeth. You have my sworn word that you will not go to hell. The oak tree is a witness, Jack declared, and he took up a bar to pry the crucifix loose. As soon as it fell from the bark, the devil leapt from the branches and ran into the night, his cloven feet leaving deep marks in the ground. Never was a man more pleased with his own craftiness than Jack. And never was a village more tired of hearing the same unbelievable tale, over and over, than Jack's. They tolerated his ways as best they could for five more years, until, to their relief, first unspoken, then spoken quite loudly, Jack died. Loose of his mortal shell, the soul of Jack rose to judgment and gave St. Peter his name. Peter looked into his book of lives, his beatific eyes going wide as they traveled down the page. With clear surprise, he flipped the page and continued reading. Oh, no. He said quietly. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you can't come in here. But I'm a good Christian, Jack protested. Christian, perhaps. Good, I don't think so. I defeated the devil once. All you did that night was show you are more wicked than even Lucifer. Down you go. With a wave of St. Peter's hand, Jack found himself plummeting at unbelievable speed through the sky and the very earth. He came to a stop in a great stone chamber lit by fire and reeking of brimstone. In front of him, a familiar figure sat on a throne of bones. Where do you think you're going? The devil asked, leaning forward in his seat. To hell. 
I suppose, said Jack. I've been cast from the door to heaven for having a bit of fun in life. <laughs> so now it's the fire for me. We can't have that. The deal was struck, remember? The devil leaned back comfortably. You made me promise not to bring your soul into my kingdom. I wouldn't go back on my word. Tricks like that are beneath me, aren't they? Jack's face fell in sorrow and confusion. Where am I to go, then? Back to Earth. Back to life? No. You are long dead. The devil smiled. What am I to do on Earth with nobody? Jack asked, bereft. Walk, I suppose. It makes me no never mind. Is there nothing you will do to help me? With that, the devil picked up a burning coal from the cave floor and flicked it at Jack. There. Now you can light your way. Jack caught it awkwardly and tossed it from hand to hand. Even without flesh to burn, the infernal coal still felt painfully hot. Before Jack could reply, the devil snapped his long fingers, and Jack rocketed upward. Jack found himself in the center of a long, empty road. He did not know which way to go, but it was not as if he had a reason to go one way over the other. The night was unforgivingly dark. Jack scarcely saw the round bit of white on the side of the road, a turnip in the dirt, likely fallen from a cart and partially chewed by some lucky wild creature. Jack dropped the burning coal inside the turnip and turned it to cast its ruddy light on the road. And Jack began to walk. <laughs>